any technology that is sufficiently um, unknown looks like magic. You know, Arthur C. Clarke said that. Well, it's the same thing, really. We have a technology that people are not knowledgeable about, the technology of deception. This is Whit Hayden. He goes by Pop. And he's a professional magician living in Los Angeles. He's almost 70 now and started doing magic when he was only 10 years old, growing up in Clarksville, Tennessee. I was a preacher's kid, and um, this old man moved into our neighborhood. Um, He was in his 80s, but he'd been a gambler his whole life. And, um, you know, back in the 20s and so, and uh, he... uh, uh, was a total reprobate. He drank whiskey right out of a bottle and chain smoked these little black cigars and cussed like a sailor. And, you know, being a preacher's kid in Clarksville, Tennessee, um, naturally I gravitated toward his society. And he taught me a lot of things. And one of them uh, was he taught me some little magic tricks, but he also taught me the shell game. Pop Hayden is one of the greatest shell game operators in the world. It's a game you've probably seen before. It requires three half walnut shells, and you put a little pea or a little rubber ball underneath one of them and mix the shells around. The person watching tries to keep up with you and then guess which shell the pea is under. People bet on it. Yes, and that, that's a mistake. Why? Because you'll never get it right. You cannot win. It's a swindle. It's a swindle. It's all a sleight of hand swindle, but it's... It's, it, you can't beat it by watching it. Pop Hayden invited us to meet him at the Magic Castle in Hollywood, which we were very excited about, because it's a private club for magicians only. It's in an old mansion dating back to 1909 and has been a mecca for magicians since 1963. We went during the day, so we had the place to ourselves, and could wander around slowly. It's like a maze. There's a secret door hidden in a bookcase, five different bars, lounges, a dining room with a $42 pork chop and very strict dress code, and also a classroom where Pop teaches what he calls a school for scoundrels. And sometimes he teaches a class specifically to teach police officers how to catch con men. They're still playing these games on the streets today, you know, so the police need to know as much as they can about it uh, so that they can uh, uh, keep an eye on it. And we like to let them know that, you know, most of these gangs are not dangerous. You know, they're crooks, but they're, you know, usually not terrible crooks. But the police need to know how it's very hard for them to break up the games or to know how to um, approach the games or even know what's going on. For example, most people think that it's just one guy behind a table you know, and taking all the people at the table. Actually, everybody at the table is in on it. There's only one sucker at the table at a time. You know, if you don't know who it is, it's probably you. (laughs) At the Magic Castle, big theaters give way to small theaters and then tiny theaters where you can watch the magicians very close up. The largest performance space in the Magic Castle is called the Palace of Mystery. Will you just tell me again, what's it called? The Palace of Mystery. This is the pa- that was the parlor of prestidigitation. This is the Palace of Mystery. I'll come back around this way. These are all the dining rooms. This is our seance room. What is this? This is our seance room. We have seances in here to contact Houdini. Um, we have seances almost every night. Um, we always get him because it's a magic castle, of course, and this place is rigged to the hilt to uh, replicate a a spiritualist seance that you might have seen in the 20s. It's rigged in here. It's rigged in here. Oh, yes, things float. The table rises and floats around, and, you know, all kinds of neat things happen. What happens when Houdini shows up? Oh, well, you know, you you hear his voice, and um, uh, it's his real voice, actually. And, uh, you know, all kinds of mysterious uh, appearances and apparitions and movements and things. It's very exciting. It's full of tricks like this. And every night, people come to deceive one another and be deceived. A secret button under a bar makes an owl screech. There's a piano that's haunted by a ghost named Irma. Irma will immediately begin playing any song you request. The walls of the Magic Castle are jam-packed with portraits of magicians past and present. Some have requested to have their ashes hidden in the frames of their own portraits, and the Magic Castle agreed, 
so there are eight of these, as Pop calls them, permanent residents. And he takes us to the portrait of Jefferson Randolph Smith, also known as Soapy Smith. He was one of the first uh, uh, true American gangsters. So why would you have a, a gangster's picture in, in the Magic Castle? Because of his, his facility with the shell game. This is the man we came to hear about. The magicians of the Magic Castle honor one of the earliest American organized crime bosses and con men because he was also an absolute master of the shell game. He revolutionized the technique and made himself quite rich off of other people's money in the process. When you start asking questions about Soapy Smith, everything begins to bleed together in strange ways. Magicians teaching police officers, crooks teaching magicians, and a very blurry line between a delightful trick and a dirty one. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. I wasn't sure if I was allowed to ask a magician how the shell game works, but Pop says the shell game is not a magic trick. It's a con game. What makes it really a con game is that there are other people involved that you don't realize are on his side, and they help you make mistakes and help you get involved, and that's where it becomes a con game. You're being swindled by the people around you without knowing it. But the actual uh, sleight of hand, um, what he would do that was very, that when he was ready to kill somebody, um, he would reach in his pocket, take some money out, and get a second pee. And then he would show the shells all empty and show the pee on the table, but he had a pee in his hand. So when he set the shells back down, he would load that pee under one of them as he was setting it back down. Then he'd show the pee under the first shell, and he'd move it around and steal it out and throw it on the floor in amongst the peanut shells and sawdust, and it would just be lost. But there's that one pea still under a shell that he has never touched. So nobody would ever guess that shell. And they'd go for the other two shells, and that's where, that's where he put the axe to their necks. This was Soapy Smith's innovation to the game, the addition of a second pea. And that's how it's done to this day. It's a felony in California, larceny by trick. And just last month, a New York man named Andrew Jones was arrested for the 17th time in 30 years for scamming people out of their money with a version of the shell game called the three-card money. It's amazing to think that we're still falling for these games today, forking over our cash to charming strangers. Soapy Smith didn't stop at the shell game. He also ran a famous soap scam. It's what got him the nickname Soapy. Well, what he would do is uh, he and some Confederates would uh, gather a um, crowd and he would start wrapping up bars of just plain soap. This is Catherine Spoody, an anthropologist and historian who studies the American West. She has a book about Soapy called That Fiend in Hell. And as he's doing it, he would wrap one of them in a, in a $5 bill before he um, wrapped it up into the uh, colored paper. And he said, now for a dollar apiece, anybody who wants to can come up here and um, pick out which one it is that has the $5 bill in it. And so he'd go through this rigmarole and someone in the crowd would say, I can do it, I can do it. And sure enough, it turned out that person picked out the $5 bar of soap, and so Soapy would go through the thing again. But it turned out that the first guy who got it was usually one of his confederates. Um, so that's the way he, he made um, his early fortunes was just uh, conning people by making them believe that they could win uh, $5 from a bar of soap. This presence of an accomplice, or a set of people who are in on it with you, is the most important feature of a con game. And leading people to believe they're smarter than you, that's the real confidence trick. We call them confidence games because they're built on the idea that I put my confidence in the sucker. You know, a real confidence game can only be done uh, with somebody who has cupidity in his soul, somebody that is larcenous in his soul. Swindles, you can do a swindle on anyone. You can swindle some old lady that, you know, out of her savings. But that's not the same as a confidence game. Confidence games where you make somebody think they have an unfair advantage on somebody else. They're willing to take that unfair advantage of somebody else, and then they get taken. 
Soapy Smith traveled all over the American West with his men, running all kinds of scams, like setting up a fake telegraph office where no messages were actually sent or received. They just take your money and never send the message. He had a fake army recruitment office where his men would steal a recruit's wallet right out of his pants while he was being checked out by the doctor. He was making a lot of money and often used it to pay the police, politicians, and judges to leave him alone and let him do what he wanted. This corruption was so well known that Soapy was often included in political cartoons. Catherine's favorite is from the Rocky Mountain News in 1892. In it, Soapy is in the middle of a group of men sitting around a table. The men seem to be arguing or discussing something, doing business of some sort. We see the governor of the state of Colorado at the time, some candidates for mayor and the sheriff. Soapy is front and center standing up and um, appears to be directing everything. But it's my opinion that one reason Soapy was chosen for that role in the cartoons is because he's wearing a beard. At the time, um, beards were seriously out of fashion, and it makes him a good person to caricature if you're drawing political cartoons. In a way, Soapy became the symbol of the underworld for Denver, simply, I think, because he had the beard. When the Klondike gold rush hit, Soapy moved from Denver to Skagway, Alaska, where he opened a saloon that people called the Real City Hall. And as the story goes, in 1898, a miner traveling through Skagway was conned out of his gold by Soapy's men. The townspeople hear of it, and um, they've had enough of Soapy. They're going to take over. Frank Reed, who was one of the surveyors of the town, um, has a gunfight. Basically, the the popular story is that there's kind of a gunfight, and uh, Soapy, both of them are shot. Uh, Soapy dies immediately, and Frank Reed um, takes another 12 days to die. And um, through the death of Soapy... uh, Skagway has no more crime, (laughs) basically. Um, That's the way the legend went. Catherine Spooty says Soapy Smith has just become more and more mythic in our imaginations over the last 118 years. Stories circulate about his incredible generosity, that he was the kind of guy who built drinking troughs for thirsty homeless dogs and passed out turkeys on Thanksgiving. And the more these stories were repeated the more important Soapy became. By the 1950s, we were calling him the Robin Hood of America. But Catherine Spooty says that when you actually do the research, you find that Soapy Smith was just a handsome, smooth-talking guy who stole a lot of money from a lot of people. A classic confidence man. Pop Hayden doesn't deny that Soapy Smith did a lot of terrible things. But he says... Isn't there something fascinating about someone who is so creative about it? Every summer, on July 8th, the magicians of the Magic Castle gather at 9.15 p.m., the approximate time Soapy was shot, to make the same toast. Here's to Soapy's ghost. I believe that magic is really kind of a celebration of uh, the archetype of the trickster. You know, brains over brawn. Um, the trickster is a character like Bugs Bunny, you know, who's always being hunted by a guy with a gun, a human being with a gun, but he always outsmarts him. In fact, he's so easy to outsmart that he doesn't even run away. He could get away at any time, but he sticks around. Why? For the joy of manipulating and, and, and making a fool out of Elmer. He enjoys playing with him. And the magician is kind of a, a celebration of that, um, that part of us that, you know, uses our brains to survive and trickery to survive. Uh, The difference is the con man, he puts the mask on his face and never takes it off. He'll be the sorcerer, or he'll be the mind reader, or he'll be the uh, honest politician, or the, uh, you know, sincere salesman. He'll be all kinds of things. But that mask has to stay on his face all the time. The magician puts on a mask and then lets it slip all the time where he's winking at you (laughs) out of it. You always know, you know, that he's screwing with you somehow, but he's just doing it for the fun of it.
Criminal is produced by Lauren Spohr, Nadia Wilson, and me. Audio mixed by Rob Byers. Alice Wilder is our intern. Julian Alexander makes original illustrations for each episode of Criminal. You can see them at thisiscriminal.com. Criminal is recorded in the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. We're a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collection of the best podcasts around. Radiotopia from PRX is supported by the Knight Foundation and MailChimp, celebrating creativity, chaos, and teamwork. And thanks to AdServe for providing their ad-serving platform to Radiotopia. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. Radiotopia. Radiotopia.